Hey, welcome back to Dad Life Chess. This is Joel. And uh, today I want to go over the classical game I just finished uh, on Lee Chess. I played a uh, classical game 30 on Lee Chess. I'm kind of doing that. I don't know if you find it easier to use one platform for a different time control. I like the fact that Lee Chess has a classical time control. If chess.com started a classical time control, I perhaps would jump on that. But um, I basically, I like playing rapid on chess.com and I play a lot of 10 minute rapid on chess.com. And then on Lee Chess, I play longer games, either game 30, 30 plus 30, or 30 plus 20, and then even the Dojo Liga games. Um, but uh, today I wanted to review this game 30, and it was it was a really cool um, London game in the sense that it was just really smooth, a uh, very smooth game. Um, unfortunately for my opponent, they allowed me uh, Kind of get away with some stuff, but we'll we'll look at the game. So I started off with d4. My opponent played knight f6. I played the accelerated London with uh, bishop f4. Uh, this is of course recommended by most resources. Uh, you can of course go knight f3 to start off with. I like the early bishop f4. Um, they played uh, d5. Here I'm actually looking into to uh, transposing into the Jabava London kind of through the London uh, the traditional London move order. Uh, but that's something I want to add to my repertoire. Today, I just decided with e3, uh, my opponent uh, ended up playing c5, which is probably the most critical line. And here is kind of a crossroads for London players. I was talking with some folks on Twitter about this. And uh, the truth is, I, I like to play, and, and you've probably seen on the channel, I like to play the knight f3 line, which I think is ultimately best for white. Um, it is recommended in International Mal Master Alex Banza's course, um, Indrik's uh, course, The London Attack, uh, a lot of books and resources. And it's probably the most theoretical and it's probably the best line. But I'm not really crazy about this line in particular. I know I mentioned it in a previous video. So I've been experimenting with kind of the old school London line. And you know, there's something about the way theory works in chess, and I don't know if you found this to be true, especially at the amateur level, which I certainly am at, definitely at the amateur level. I feel like the ebbs and flows of theory kind of play themselves out, and you'll see a lot of players play the most critical lines against your system, and then when you change it up to kind of go back to the less theoretical or less critical lines, they don't really know how to play it um, as well. And the interesting thing is when you play this C3 line, you technically give black the opportunity to get equality early on in the game, but they don't always know how to play it. And if you've played this a lot, you kind of are more familiar with the middle game structures. So uh, my opponent played knight C6, which is very, uh, uh, very much so opening theory. And then they played queen b6. Here, I oftentimes will contest it. I'm not afraid of this kind of pawn structure here. Sometimes you'll get this kind of stuff. But this guy is going to be um, annoying. And uh, I, I don't mind these kind of structures at all. I prefer this. Uh, the computer even says that, that white is doing better. Um, however, I played queen b3. And then my opponent played c4. Now, obviously, there's a there's a line where they oftentimes will play this bishop f5. This one happens to be an absolute blunder because because I've brought my knight into d2 first before playing knight f3, if they take here threatening my rook, I can simply just drop back with my queen and there's nothing that they can do. I can simply develop. There's even some crazy tactics uh, with this bishop taking my pawn. But the point is um, by now having this structure, they really want to develop their bishop out here. They don't want to, you know, basically block it behind the pawn chain that would completely uh, erase all of their opening ideas. And I'm going to be able to break over, break open their, their overextended C4 pawn. So they certainly don't want to do that. So oftentimes players will play G6, which happens to be the best move. But here there's a very critical response. And that is E4 exclam. Uh, you're going to be uh, contesting the center right away. And no matter which way black takes, if they decide to do so, uh, you're going to be able to get a slight advantage. And this, I actually really like this line. And so here we already are on move eight. And I feel like we're in the driver's seat. 
we've sidestepped a lot of these ultra critical sacrificial uh, gambit lines when you play this Knight of Threes variation. So anyway, that's where I'm at right now. I will probably change in the next couple weeks and uh, change it up. But here we are. And uh, so my opponent played uh, Knight takes E4. I was expecting the pawn takes, uh, but now I get this. I'm on the queen. The queen drops back. And uh, there's a lot of things you can do. You can even play rook here. You can put the knight here to stop the bishop from coming. You can get your bishop out. Uh, very good kind of position. But my opponent played knight takes e4, which is not a bad move. It's a little bit, probably not the most common. I simply took the knight off, takes back, and now I take this pawn. Material is even. However, if you look at my pawn structure and my control in the center uh, and versus this uh, basically doubled pawn, it's a doubled pawn on uh, e4, and it's going to be a weakness. Black's going to have to do a lot of work to protect it. Goes here. Here, the computer actually suggests queen b3. It's, a, it's an idea I saw later. However, I just decided I didn't want this pawn to advance. I threatened I'm, the push of this pawn, which would be disastrous. Uh, so I just blocked the pawn, bishop e3. I thought I'm just going to develop my knight. And uh, so my opponent drops back with his queen to c7. And here I play queen b3, now seeing this threat. Now, the computer doesn't like this as much. Um, they actually are recommending to castle queenside. It seems interesting. There's another option of um, even just playing e5 here. All these are not exactly moves I would see right away. My opponent played the probably the number two or number three suggested move, Stockfish e6. And uh, I was looking at d5 here, but I decided to play knight e2. Wanted to get a little more development. And then my opponent played bishop g7. Um, they're obviously wanting to castle, get their king into safety. But I thought, you know what? I'm just going to attack the center. I want to disrupt this... Um, this pawn chain, basically this protection of this bishop, uh, force the knight to do something. They take, I take back, and here they castle. Um, I ended up castling here, and then they played a6, which I thought was a very interesting move. I was expecting something maybe in the lines of this. Whoops, sorry. This Then I was going to put my uh, queen here, kick it out. It's a game I feel like I'm gonna, I have better squares. This bishop's basically a glorified pawn protecting uh, their pawn on e4. I like my position, but when my opponent played a6, I thought that's kind of interesting. It's weakening these dark squares. I actually looked at playing here right away, but I thought I'm just going to bring my rook into the center, uh, you know, play principal chess, play good moves, and my opponent unfortunately uh, makes, I'm uh, sorry, uh, they played the other rook played here, which is a huge blunder. Probably can see it already, and uh, yes, that's correct. I played bishop, to b6, my opponent moved away, takes. They cannot take with the queen. Why is that? Because this is discovery on the queen. Um, so they take back here, and once they took back, they realized that this is coming, and my opponent resigned. Well, I was granted this game only lasted 19 moves. Uh, my opponent didn't make any serious mistakes except for allowing the weakening of the dark squares and we got a really good position. So basically, my my point behind this, this video is a lot of people say the London system is boring. The London system is, you know, bad opening. It stunts your growth, yada, yada, yada. You know, you can't play the London system if you want to improve. And I actually disagree with that. I, I know that grandmasters are far better at chess than I am. And I know that a lot of players can can say that, uh, you know, the, the London is maybe not the best opening for you long term. And maybe they're right in the sense that if you are a maybe a child prodigy or you're a, an improving uh, young person and you have a lot of potential in chess and you want to, you know, really gain a lot of rating points, then yeah, maybe the London is not a great opening. However, if you're like me and you're just an adult improver, you have a family, you have kids, you have a um, you have a spouse, you, you, you don't have a, you have a full-time job. You don't have the time to devote to a lot of opening theory. Um, and so that's why I like the, the London system. Case in point, I've been doing a lot more serious uh, chess study, a lot of uh, reading through some books, going through a lot of tactics. 
in the last few weeks, I've done almost zero opening study. I've, you know, looked at my lines a little bit here and there, haven't done any serious opening study, but I still feel confident when I play a game, especially with the London Haze team. So anyway, if you don't, uh, uh, if, if for all the London haters out there, I know the London is, is boring. You can play it in a way that is exciting and or maybe not as thrilling as you would like, but even when it's boring, uh, you can cause your opponent perhaps uh, to kind of lose the thread of the game. And you are able to even win early on against a pretty strong opponent in a rapid game or a classical game, I should say. So anyway, that's my plug for the London system. Play it even if it's boring. Thanks for watching Dad Life Chess. We'll talk to you later.